Hey guys, this is video number two in the chords theory series, where in this series we're looking at how to build chords on the guitar. Not only build them, but really understand the underlying logic and theory of what's going on. And in this video, we're going to explore the secret of tertian intervals, tertian triads. And uh, in the first video of the series, video number one, I introduced the idea that chords are not random. When I first picked up a guitar and I learned a bunch of chord shapes, the, the focus was on where to place my fingers. It was my relationship to the guitar. Finger three goes on this fret, this string, and I didn't really think so much about the relationship of the notes themselves and why I was playing those, those fingers in those positions, but just play it. Play it, damn it. <laughs> that was basically the instruction that I got. So now at this stage, we're really gonna look at why are we playing those notes? Why do they sound good together? And how can we use those, those fundamental relationships between the notes and intervals to inform why we should select certain chords as we compose music? So for example, I when I first started, I, I would play, say, a C and then I'd play an A major and it didn't sound very good together. Those are very common chords, but if you play a C to an A minor, ooh, that sounds nicer. And if then we go to a G, hmm, G sounds good with C. Back to C, E minor sounds good to G, and then back to C. There's something going on there and it's not random. And when we get into tertian intervals, that's going to explain why all of this sounds good. Now, in the previous video, you saw that basically the reason these chords sound good because chords are subsets of a subset. And by that, I mean the seven chords in a key stem from the major scale of that key. So looking at the key of C, for example, the C major scale is made up of notes C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. This major scale is a subset of the chromatic scale, all 12 notes of music. And starting on the C note, interval one in the major scale, if we play C, skip a note, skip D and play E, and then skip another note, F, to play G, if we play these three notes together, C, E, G, every other note of the major scale, together these notes form the C major chord. C, E, and G are compatible together and form a nice harmony when played simultaneously. And when we start on the D note, the second note of the C major scale, and play every other note, or D, F, and A, together these three notes form another chord that sounds very nice. Then rotating once more to start on the E note, playing every other note of the C major scale, together we have E, G, and B that sound very pleasing together as well. And moving on down the line, by starting on each scale degree of the major scale, we can build out seven chords. Seven triads, where tri of the word triad means three. Three note chords. Now when you look at all of the chords like this, focusing on the intervals between the notes, the resulting triads look alike, right? In the sense that each one forms a similar triangle. The intervals of the C major chord resemble those of the D minor chord, which also resemble those of the E minor chord, and so on, where the geometry of each pattern seems almost identical. Yet when you look a little closer, the intervals of each triad do differ slightly, or at least some of the triangles are different, while some of them are the same. To show you what I mean, all we have to do is label each interval with its respective value, like this, where the capital M3 means major third, and the lowercase m3 means minor third. So in the C major chord, for example, a major third separates C and E, while a minor third separates E and G. The first interval of the chord is a major third, while the second interval is a minor third. And in the D minor chord, the interval between D and F is a minor third, while the interval between F and A is a major third. So in this chord, a minor third is the first interval, and a major third is the second interval. Likewise, in the E minor chord, E and G are separated by a minor third, and G and B are separated by a major third. 
Then in the F major chord, a major third separates F and A, while a minor third separates A and C, and so on. And so what these labels do is they highlight the fact that not only are the chords made up of different intervals, but there's also variety in the order of intervals used. Each chord is comprised of major third and or minor third intervals that are arranged in different sequences. So each chord in a key, each of these triads is a tertian triad because each is made up from intervals of a third, whether it's major or minor. So the number three plays a significant role in music, especially in the construction of chords. In fact, the phrase tertian triad is even a double reference to the number three since each triad has three notes that are built from tertian intervals of a third. Tertian, triad, three, and three. But three isn't the only number that appears in chords. There's also another one that shows up in every harmony that you hear. It's a number that's equally important in music, and that number is five. And that's because in each of these triads, the first two intervals add up to an interval of a fifth. In the C major chord, for example, the interval between C and G is a perfect fifth. C to E is a major third, and E to G is a minor third, and combined, this major third plus the minor third interval equals a perfect fifth. Likewise, in the D minor chord, the minor third between D and F plus the major third between F and A equals a perfect fifth. The interval between D and A is a perfect fifth, which you can clearly see because orange D is closely related to orange yellow A from their relationship in the circle of fifths. And within every chord in this key, or any key for that matter, these tertian intervals of major thirds and minor thirds combine to form the interval of a fifth between the first note of a chord and the last note. Now, in my full course, I go into all sorts of detail into how all of these notes and interval patterns work. But just to recap here, let's pause and really soak in how cool this is. So the major scale pattern is really the foundation of chords in music. And this pattern is just a subset of the chromatic scale of the 12 notes that are possible in music. And the reason the major scale sounds especially good, why these notes sound good together, is because the chromatic scale is really just a rearrangement of the circle of fifths, a fundamental pattern in music that explains the relationships between all notes and keys in music. When the 12 notes of music are arranged in a circle of fifths sequence, and we highlight a group of neighbors that are adjacent to each other, and then rotate this pattern back into the chromatic scale sequence, still highlighting just this subset, we get the major scale pattern. And then from that, when we play every other note, starting on each scale degree of the major scale, we come up with seven triads that sound especially good. And with color, you can see all of these relationships between pattern rearrangements and interval connections and the affinities between scale degrees like magic. You cannot make this up. And as it so happens, all of these interval patterns in each chord are made up of major third or minor third intervals, tertian intervals. And these tertian intervals are what really influence the sound of chords, why each chord sounds the way it does, whether it's major or minor. Now, when we're looking at these patterns in their circular formations, it's easy to see how this rotation happens from one chord to the next in a given key. But there's another way that we can look at these chords in a table format to really solidify what we're looking at here. So when we unwind all of the notes from the chromatic scale into a line like this at the top of the table, you can see how the intervals form the major scale pattern built from a sequence of whole steps and half steps. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, repeated down the line, which we can also label using scale degrees or numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, and so forth. Now the reason we repeat it in a linear sequence like this is because the pattern is inherently cyclical. So it just repeats itself once you unwind the circular formation into a line. And when we play every other note of this major scale in the key of C, we can build seven triads starting on each respective scale degree. So starting on interval one, C, we can play the C major chord, made up of notes C, E, and G. Then starting on the second scale degree, D, we can play the D minor chord, D, F, A. And working our way down the line, we can play each triad beginning on its own respective scale degree, E minor, F major, G major, A minor, 
and then B diminished. Before repeating C again. Now the gaps or intervals between notes, again, are tertian intervals. Some are major thirds, marked here by a capital M3, and others are minor thirds, marked by a lowercase m3. And the name of each chord comes from the first tertian interval in that chord. The C major chord has a major third as the first interval, so it's C major. The D minor chord has a minor third as the first interval, which is why it sounds and is called minor. The E minor chord has a minor third as the first interval, and that interval, that tertian interval of a minor third, gives it its name and its sound, a minor or more melancholy sound. F major starts with a major third and has a stronger, more stable sound because of that major third. G major starts with a major third. A minor starts with a minor third. And then the B diminished, the diminished chord sounds extra weak because it has two minor thirds, unlike any other chord in a key. These two minor thirds combined sound extra melancholy or sad or just kind of wimpy, hence the name diminished. So again, these chords are So you can see how ultimately it's the intervals themselves that influence the sound of a given chord. It's not so much the notes or the pitches themselves. So in the C major chord, for example, it's made up of notes C, E, and G, but it's the intervals of a major third and a minor third that together combine to form the sound of the C major chord. So the term major is reflected in both the name of the chord and in the sound of the chord. In a minor chord, a minor chord, D minor, is the namesake of the interval, and also the sound sake of that interval in the sense that it sounds minor. It also, these terms also give us a vocabulary when we're playing with other musicians or when we're thinking about these chords. So say you're playing with someone and they say, hey, I wanna play a C major. You know they wanna hear a bright, happy sound that starts on C because of that major interval. Likewise, if they play, or if they say, hey, let's play a D minor, you know, it's gonna count, sound kind of sad and start on a D, but it's gonna have that minor interval that gives it its signature sound. So these terms give us a vocabulary and a way to think of the sounds of the harmonies that we're playing. But as for as cool as these intervals are, the major, minor, and diminished, those terms, there's an even more concise and cooler way to refer to intervals, and that is using Roman numerals. Those are the old time numbers that you see on grandfather clocks. But they're not just limited to clocks that you see in homes, these fancy numbers. They're actually used a lot in music, and they have a really cool, powerful way to communicate information, which is what we will look at in the next video. So thanks for joining me in this exploration of the secret of tertian intervals, and I'll catch you in the next video. Mm -hmm.